Hello everyone, this is Tinko Tinef and this is my vlog. Um, so this entry I want to share uh, how Sun Myung Moon became my personal savior and messiah. Uh, because if it wasn't for him and the Unification Church, I would have never understood Jesus Christ or God because because the way I'm set and because I, the way I was indoctrinated I needed a very logical very kind of science-based explanation about things and um, just re listening to religious lectures or you know biblical readings uh, was not really making much impact on me um, so When I met the Unification Church and was introduced to the teaching of uh, San Myung Moon, um, I was really not prepared to listen anything about God because I was religiously indoctrinated as a Marxist atheist to believe that God doesn't exist and hate God at the same time, which is very irrational. But nevertheless, this is what is expected um, if if one is a member of the Marxist atheist cult. Um, so I never thought about it or questioned it. Everyone hated God and everyone said they don't believe in God. So I was like, okay. And uh, it was important because if people went to church, they were uh, persecuted. So I thought, okay, this must be really bad to go to church and it must be really bad to believe in God. And after many years, you just become cynical and you don't even think about it. You just, you know, you naturally think people who believe in God are idiots, you know, for, for believing in God. You know, who would do this if, you know, it's being uh, persecuted and, you know, they're being punished severely for, for this, you know. I never <laughs> had any other thoughts. I was just like, yeah, that's, that's how it is. And um, always uh, examples were given of how terrible it was people to be for people to believe in God and how stupid it was to go to church and I was like okay so when I went to Unification Church uh, that was that was the me that I met the Unification Church so I was like oh my goodness these people you know like they've lost their minds completely you know talking about God and you know like uh, and I didn't feel like personally I need to involve in any way but because they were British missionaries and they spoke English and um, I found it actually quite pleasant to have someone to speak English with after the three years of uh, studying English in inter international school in Iraq. Uh, so I thought, mm, it's nice to spend time with them. And of course, they're religious, they want to talk about God. But I was like, yeah, okay, you know, I'll just like, you know, prove them wrong, you know. And, um, and then, yeah, they talked about God, like the first lecture was about the principles of creation and how God created the universe and what were the principles that God used and that function and kind of underlying the entire functional setup of the universe. Um, and because of the mention of God, I just thought, no, that, this cannot be true. So I, I didn't even get, give it much thought. Uh, I just said, yeah, fine, you know, that's what you believe, but I cannot believe this. So I was kind of ignoring it and asking silly questions like who created God. Um, and then there was the second lecture of the fall of men and it explained how um, um, later on I found out, actually this was the most difficult thing for Sun Myung Moon to find out, um, because uh, he was praying and you know meeting uh, people in the spirit world in person and talking to them and trying to find out what happened in, in their life. And for him this was very important because from what I understand and like the way the, way the divine principle is uh, set up as a book, um, he really wanted, he didn't want to just know about these people and what they did, but he wanted to know what works. Like, how do we, how does God work with people and in this world? What works and what doesn't? And um, the, the last part uh, or the third part, large part of the divine principle is the principles of restoration. And basically, the principles of restoration analyzes the historical figures in the Bible 
their experiences and the models or the matrix, uh, the paradigms that enable them to become the people that God could use uh, as, their, as his instruments to pass on messages or to exercise his will uh, and guide people uh, into kind of tuning with what he wanted life to be or what he designed life to be originally. Um, so, like, it made me think um, in the beginning, especially through the fall of man, that th this is um, this is really answering um, questions about life in a very logical fashion. And yes, okay, like one had to kind of sit down and and. Uh, imagine that Adam and Eve existed, but even even an atheist like would say, okay, there, there must have been like a man and a woman originally, like the first evolved through labor monkeys uh, that were actually human, you know, that had intellect, you know, and could uh, interact as human beings, you know. Um, so their behavioral patterns um, became model for all other humans. Um, and I thought this actually really makes sense, you know, that um, and now through kind of understanding more and more um, the, the foundational concept of psychology and um, psychotherapy uh, and the idea that parents uh, really, really influence uh, the development of their children in the first seven years uh, in a non-verbal way, like through their behavior and through the, the way they, they interact with the world. I thought, uh, like to me, it made sense. I, I just thought, like, okay, this is actually quite interesting. That if something happened to Adam and Eve, then it probably ruined life for all next generations. Um, and actually, th this really, um, it just couldn't leave my mind. This thought, I thought, this is this is important. This is not something to be ignored. Um, and it's important on, on a level that makes a huge difference in life. So it, like, I, I should not just pretend like I never heard this, you know. So I was kind of thinking and, and becoming interested in um, to know why they were saying these things. And, and then trying to understand, okay, like they believe God exists. So, and they believe, you know, he created Adam and Eve and they had a purpose. Uh, he had a purpose. God had a purpose for the creation of Adam and Eve. And, um, okay, what is the purpose? You know, um, so Sun Myung Moon he conversed with Adam and Eve in the spirit world, and uh, from his own explanations, um, uh, like uh, uh, examples he gave in different gave in different speeches and lectures, uh, that he met with Adam and Eve, and they had not known what happened to them. Like they didn't understand what the significance of the fall was. And why they were kicked out from the garden. Why they could not converse with God freely the way they conversed before the fall. Um, and it was due to their immaturity. They were not unable to understand. Well, they weren't able to understand pretty much anything. Like um, why God created the universe. And, you know, like if you imagine like teenage children and you try to explain to them why you created, why you build your house or why you have your business. You know, they're just sitting there looking at you and looking through you. <laughs> like, I have no idea why you're telling me these things. I have no clue what you're talking about even, you know, uh, is their reaction. So Adam and Eve must have been in a similar state uh, when Eve was being tempted and then she tempted Adam. Uh, and this temptation, it really, and, and the principle explains what exactly was wrong with the temptation and how it changed Eve and how it changed Adam. Uh, and And the idea is that it was selfishness. So the way that God designed the world was um, for, for he, like he wanted this world to be our, his children's world, our world. He created all this world for us and he's invisible. He cannot interact with it directly. He can only interact with the world through us. Um, and his spirit, if we listen to what Jesus says, his spirit can dwell in us. And from the Eastern uh, spiritual traditions of uh, uh, Tantra, 
reaching this kind of highest level of meditation where you're one with the universe, we understand that purely on, on like energy level, uh, people understand that this is possible and we should be striving for this to, to be one with the universe, with the universal principles. So uh, because Reverend Moon comes from Asia and he understands this underlying philosophy of Asia and, and the understanding of yin and yang and uh, the, the origin uh, of yin and yang and how everything expresses through the yin and yang plus and minus. So he applied uh, <clears throat> this knowledge or these revelations which were given to the people in Asia uh, through which they look at life and the universe. So he applied this uh, in conjunction with the Christian faith uh, to understand better the the way God created, the principle God used to create the universe, <clears throat> and the way that Adam and Eve also, as plus and minus, had definitive functions uh, for each other in relationship to God and towards their children, and as the center of the new world or the new society that was supposed to form around them, or from them, uh, more precisely, as the parents of humankind. Uh, of every next generation of humans. Um, so they're uh, not being able to develop themselves properly in accordance with how they were designed. Um, it, it became like every, every... They became handicapped or underdeveloped. They could not develop their full, full potential. So um, they didn't know how, um, how to use life and how to make life meaningful to themselves. Uh, instead, they just did whatever they felt like, you know. And um, were they happy? No. It was life or in history, human history, is it history of misery? Yeah. War, conflict, murder, theft, claims for ownership of this and this, and then people come and they want to claim ownership also, and we fight. And, um, so it's, it's quite a sad history. Uh, so, and do we want to live like this? Like I was, you know, and I'm, I'm think, I think also Sun Myung Moon, uh, Reverend Moon, he was also wondering, like, do we really want to live like this? Do we really want to fight with people over things and, and money? And uh, do we want to kind of just like live all our life, you know, accumulating things and um, at the cost of anything and anybody? Um, and the answer is not really, because it doesn't really make people happy to do this. Uh, there is no rich people that have, that have enough. This is quite interesting phenomena, because we can say, okay, like if you have certain level of income, you're a rich person, and you should be satisfied. Like you should feel like, okay, now I'm happy. But no one feels like this. Or everybody who's reached this level looks at the people higher than them and say, oh, I want to live like them. I want to be able to afford the bigger car and the bigger house. Um, and we never appreciate what we have. Uh, and I don't think that this makes people happy, or at least I don't see them being happy. Um, and the people who, uh, religious people who kind of deny ownership and property and look for happiness in a more internal way through observing the universe and kind of understanding that all this vast universe, everything on earth was created for us um, by God, by a loving parent, uh, and it belongs to us. Uh, and we can feel like it belongs to us, like we don't need to own it. We know God created it for us, so we don't have to have a paper saying we own it. You know? um, so this, this kind of concept I found out, found out from Sun Myung Moon because he really thought this, these things were important and he thought that they were important to share with people. Um, so when I met the church, I didn't meet him personally, but I read his teachings and, um, or I was given lectures on his teachings and on his life. And I remember one of the first seven-day workshops, uh, there was a British uh, uh, missionary who gave a lecture um, about the life of Jesus. And um, basically the, the message that came across 
to me from this uh, lecture was um, that Jesus was not a rational person. Uh, he didn't think about his own benefit. He, for some reason, somehow, he was able to see people as precious uh, and of great value, and he thought about them and treated them as such people. And even though he didn't say much in his life, and even less was recorded, I guess, like I don't think people thought he was such an important person that they have to record every word he said, but the things that he said that really impacted people that they could not forget. 10, 20, 30, 40 years later, they could not forget. They were so uh, overwhelmed by his uh, love for this world and humankind that uh, even now, 2,000 years later, uh, people, when, when they come uh, to meet his person, uh, they're completely transformed. And I can say, during this lecture, I was completely transformed as well. I could suddenly see the person of Jesus Christ uh, and his desire to make this world a better place. And uh, I could see the same uh, in Sun Min Moon and his wife Hak Jahan Moon. I know to people who don't know anything about them, uh, this will probably sound strange, like, why am I making this comparison? Uh, but I honestly don't have anybody else to compare them with. Because, like, the way that... And, of course, like, uh, people will say, oh, but Trevor Moon, he's a, a rich person, he has a lot of money, and he did a lot of things politically and financially. Um, and, yes, this is true, but nobody is asking why he did these things. And I was interested in... Why, he, why was he doing this thing? So in his speeches, he explains. Uh, and like he could live a comfortable life, but he chose not to. He was always pioneering new projects and uh, trying to uh, introduce a God-centered point of view in business, in politics, in social life, in NGO, in science, uh, in the interfaith dialogue. Uh, and this is actually quite interesting i was thinking like okay like why would you have interfaith dialogue uh why would you bring people from different faiths together to talk about god um if they already talk about god but what i kind of figured out over time is that um to reverend moon god was not the muslim god and the buddhist god and the hindu god uh, and the fractions and the sects, or the Christian God and the fractions and the sects of these uh, faiths. <clears throat> but he was the God that was the parent of humankind. So um, he inspired all these faiths, um, and therefore they somehow need to find a way to see this, that they were inspired by the same God. And he was trying to urge people to look into, through his own example as well, by really trying to ex exemplify a person that lived for the sake of others, uh, that offers all his money uh, to NGO projects, to international conferences, to um, mission work, to creating projects that would inspire dialogue and uh, and many times he he told us the members because our church was never rich and there is a lot of critic about this oh you know see Reverend Moon took all the money and you're very poor and um, but he explained many times like he he doesn't he doesn't use the money for himself like he buys property but the property belongs to the organization doesn't belong to him personally and if you don't believe you can check the findings of the Korean tax office who confirmed this after his passing that there were no there were no properties on his name and on his children's names um, and yes there are certain businesses which were managed by himself and his children uh, and 
some some of his costs were covered uh, by the work he did. But this is like every company does this. Uh, he he felt he he has a mission, and he felt that the money that the world has uh, there is two ways to use them. One is for uh, to advance God's providence and to advance God's culture uh, of this that. Uh, we are God's children and um, we should uh, live what, like one family under God. Or we should be selfish and accumulate money and do so at the expense of others, but for no higher purpose. Like most businesses do now and most politicians. They, they want to have money to have bigger house and another newer car and... Uh, and there is nothing wrong with this, um, but if this is the sole purpose of doing things um, and just taking care of your own family and kind of using the public, whether it's business, you know, the money is not your money, it's it's the money that people give to you for, for the products that you make or the services you provide. So they're technically not, not your money, they're still the money of the people that they give in faith to you. Uh, and what we do with this money, uh, whether we uh, allow this money to circulate back into the economy and kind of benefit the people that invested in us uh, or bought our products uh, or not, uh, it, it determines if this is a selfish or unselfish act. And um, Raymond Moon always tried to uh, make sure that the money that the Unification Church had, the Unification Movement had, were used for a higher purpose. And this doesn't mean that mistakes were not made. It's a big organization, rich, you can say, with a lot of money. Um, people join the Unification Movement for many reasons. Uh, some are selfish, some unselfish. Uh, but he, he, he took upon himself this position of, of Jesus uh, kind of mindset not to not to consider people fallen enough to be thrown away like with with the mind of jesus what what i was really really impressed with was that jesus looked at, upon people and and thought there is a way to be forgiven and there is a way it doesn't matter what you've done there is a way forward that doesn't include um dragging yourself down like i can give you forgiveness is the message of jesus i will forgive you i will set you free even if no one else does and reverend ha reverend moon has the same mindset uh even though people um in the education movement made mistakes and surely they caused a lot of uh maybe damage to people or trouble uh, uh including for those who you know, maybe misuse money or uh, like I, I never was interested in con concrete cases. I always thought this is very unfortunate that uh, we even have to talk about things like this because I thought here we are, you know, we're trying to uh, set up an organization that, you know, kind of live, tries to exemplify the living for the sake of others. And um, we're not able to, like we fell short. But then I was thinking about myself and I was like, okay, what if I was this person and making these decisions and I was given like a lot of money to start a project or, you know, to, to would I have been done any better than this? And it's very difficult to say because, you know, um, it's not an easy task to be trusted by someone and to be given money. And this is one, one reason why I don't play lottery because I feel um, like I was, you know, buying tickets for the lottery and, and then one day I was thinking, okay, well, what does it even mean? What if I win? What do I really win? And I don't know, it suddenly <laughs> dawned on me that I'm winning the, the money of people like myself who in their last hope give their last money in the hope that their life will change. And, and the burden of this money is this collected feeling of these millions of people 
And that's why many people who win the lottery, they, they, they can't enjoy the money. Like their life really goes downhill from there. Um, and I thought, mm, I don't know, I don't think I'm ready for this. So I decided I, I would better not buy tickets for the lottery because I don't think I'm ready for this. I don't think I'm ready to win the lottery and, you know, wake up with 100 million euro, for example. What will I do if I had 100 million euro? What will my relatives and friends do if I had 100 million euro tomorrow? Um, what would the world do? Suddenly I'm this celebrity and like everybody knows and suddenly, you know, like everyone thinks I can help them and, you know, and I maybe want to, uh, but then after, and some people, they don't, they don't think you, you should help. They demand that you help and they held, hold you accountable for the fact that you haven't helped yet uh, or that or that you are not helping you know so uh, all kinds of really like difficult situations can arise from there and and i thought i don't know i don't i don't really think i need this in my life like i would rather just have a kind of a simple life and enjoy the simple things and you know try to take care of my family as much as i can try to take care of my friends as much as i can um and in this, uh, Sun Myung Moon and the Unification Church have been really instrumental to help me um, see myself as a person who can do this. A person who can hold on to himself, uh, who can set such dreams for themselves. Uh, who can navigate in a very complex environment through difficulties and, you know, easy times and uh, figure out that uh, what we're being told success is may not be. Um, some people uh, saw in me, uh, many people saw in me a very successful person. And I looked at myself and I, I wanted to be a successful person when I was younger, like uh, after finishing high school. I could be a diplomat. Um, I could be a businessman. Um, but I was looking at these choices and I was thinking, can this make me a better person? And I was, I didn't know why I was asking myself this question, I guess because of this concept of the moral citizen. Um, and because in a Marxist atheist cult, um, only the party elites are allowed to have money and things. So the proletarians, the ordinary people, they're not allowed to have money and things, which is, which is also a very religious thing, if you think about it, you know. So they're blaming other religions, you know, for taking uh, people's money away and using them uh, as they wish. But they do exactly the same, like they take everybody's money through taxation. They don't call it donations, they call it taxation. <laughs> and then they just give, give the money to each other and go and do whatever they wish, buy whatever they wish, send their kids whatever they wish. And think that this is blessing, that this is something glorious and they deserve it. You know? uh, so I was looking at myself and thinking, do I want this? Do I want to be a millionaire? Like, how does my life improve if I was a millionaire? And I... For some reason, I couldn't find the benefits for myself. I thought it would be nice to have the millions, but then you have to worry that, you know, pretty much everyone, everyone who knows you will probably want a, a, a piece of it, you know, some part of this money, you know. And, um, and then the interaction will be um, because of the money, not because of who we are as people. And I thought, hmm, I am not sure I want this, really, you know. Uh, and I know there are many rich people who don't live such a life. But I was sitting there thinking for myself as a 18-year-old uh, person, 19-year-old person, thinking, you know, can I, can I manage this? You know, can I not be arrogant? Can I still respect people? Can I still respect myself if I'm rich, you know? And I couldn't answer yes to this. I was like, I don't know, actually. So, 
yeah. And when I met um, Reverend Moon, even not f physically, like I don't know him as a person, like one to one. I, I feel I know him as a person one to one because of all his speeches, because um, because of all his very personal, the personal things that he's sharing in his speeches. I feel like I can really relate to this person, uh, and I really really respect this person, uh, and I've learned a lot from him. Uh, very practical things like how to, um, you know, how to find the center for for life for myself, how to orient myself in life uh, with the concept in mind that I was created by God and everything else was created by God and all the other people around me they are created by God and they have God's spirit in them. So how important is this? Like no one is. An ordinary person. Everyone is a divine spirit, and they may not have been raised in love, and they may not have been raised um, in a situation where they could uh, look at themselves and feel valuable, because they were not given this sense uh, that they are valued by their own surroundings, you know, by their own relatives, maybe and friends. Uh, but that doesn't change the fact that they were created by God with the full potential and with the original mind that is capable of guiding them to become these people. Uh, and given the right environment and opportunities, uh, people would rather live a life that has this deeper meaning and is removed from just being focused on material things but has a more balanced like material things are important but also internal things are important and this mindset actually uh, introduces very interesting concepts because I was thinking okay um, okay now we live in this world now we know this history that we know um, that we're being taught in schools, so this is our national history, so um, everything is presented as a, as a fact, you know. But then I was thinking, okay, but if Adam and Eve were not supposed to fall, and if this world is only the way it is, and this history is only be the way it is because of the fall, then what would the world look like if they hadn't fallen? And I was like, this is actually a really cool thing to think about, you know. So I spent a great deal of uh, kind of contemplating on this. And uh, really interesting concepts came out of this. And Reverend Moon <laughs> is at the, right at the center of these inspirations because many of the things that he did in his life, many of the projects that he initiated in his life, uh, they have this uh, culture of being for the benefit of others, uh, which is very similar to the culture with which God created the universe. Um, and because of this, I could see that in this human world, we can initiate and maintain projects that elevate the value of a human being, uh, the value of uh, life itself, and the quality of the experience of life. Like, we don't have to be busy taking things away from each other. Because they're, they're created for us. Like, I mean, even if you take everything, like, fine. You can take everything. There's like the whole universe left that you cannot take. So what are you going to do? It's like, okay, go take the moon. Go take Mars. Go take Venus. You know, so now you own them. And what? Are you happier? Like, you're going to abuse everybody else so that you can own these things, and this will make you happy. Really? I don't think so. You may feel powerful, you may feel like, oh, I'm like God now, but no, you're not. Because there is like gazillions of stars and planets that you don't own. So you're a puty, petty, miserable, uh, 
delusional person that sits there thinking you're holding what like a speck in the universe uh, a speck of a speck in the universe and you're like oh I'm very important now it's like no you're not so if we stop doing this and if we stopped respecting and appreciating people who do this you know stealing from everybody like saying oh water is not a human right like i want to control all the water okay fine you control all the water do you really control all the water no you control uh some water because you can't control all the water and it doesn't belong to you anyway you can't own it because it doesn't belong to you you didn't create it and you can't uh, put a tap on every raindrop you know and all the water that exists in the universe you know compared to all the water that exists in the universe you know the water on earth is like a like a dust particle <laughs> and and you feel great and yeah this is like this is like this gives meaning to your life like seriously like is this how low you go and we have to respect this because you can buy a new car and you can have like zillions of money in your bank account we have to respect you for this i mean if somebody wants to respect people like this it's fine but i try to understand what it means to be a person like this and and it's a very lonely place and i don't think it makes anyone happy really happy truly happy because i know business people who would you know for for the sake of their business and profit they would you know not spend time with their friends and children and family and it's very tempting you know because when you're really dedicated to a business you feel like oh i have to do it i have to succeed and and usually the thought is like i want to do it because i want my family to be well but at the same time we're ignoring our families to succeed in a business or to succeed as a professionally or educationally so um it's kind of going out of balance and then it doesn't make us happy because we want to be a good a good person a good husband a good wife we want to be a good parent we want to be a good person in the company and friends of our friends we want that they will trust us and we can trust them and support each other like we need these things it's not just we want them we really need these things like we can't live in isolation like we can but we're not happy if we do so and what i find is that uh sun and moon um many of his projects they're trying to open the doors between us and to connect people to allow allow people to connect because he understands that god created this world and created our life uh and and by being together and sharing in our dreams and ideals for a better world um and by not fighting with each other um we actually create a better world and i've been to many of the events of the unification church and you know especially our kind of bigger bigger gathering like uh gatherings like you meet people from every corner of the world and every race and nationality who stand in front of god and next to each other uh as brothers and sisters who don't see color who don't see nationality uh and and this is the utopian dream this is the dream of the true democracy and the dream of the heavenly kingdom to be able to live in a place like this and i know many um churches and many religious organizations they um they would experience something similar within their own community like i i would i was thinking i'm not a muslim but i was thinking if you go if you went to mecca and you worship there with people from all over, all over the world this is how you would feel and if you were a jewish person going to israel uh to worship or a christian going to israel to worship 
suddenly where you come from doesn't really matter and, and your skin color doesn't matter, your status doesn't matter, whether you're re rich and poor doesn't matter because you're there for a higher purpose than yourself. And this is beautiful. Um, and this is what the world needs. Uh, so I found that for myself, um, in the moment when I really was looking for answers uh, for my own personal life, um, and I had questions about the world, uh, Sun Myung Moon uh, and the Unification Church, they came uh, to rescue me personally. Uh, and they had every intention to do so because the British missionaries, they had left their homeland and they had decided to um, come to Bulgaria and offer their time, energy, uh, make conditions fast and pray and do cold showers uh, to find people like myself and to guide us to find a higher dimension to life for ourselves. Um, and of course, like as every church, you know, I think uh, the dream was to find more members. But I think at the end of the day, people who really engage in mission and taking care of others, uh, it becomes like a parental experience. And parents, loving parents, parents who really kind of have the passion and desire to take care of their children and have the happiness of their children in mind, they don't need their children to be like them or to obey them all the time. They, they want their children to be able to be mature people who can make meaningful choices and protect themselves and have a meaningful life, a successful life. And that makes them happy. So I think the British missionaries, many of them, of course, they, they, they wanted to find new members for the church. But beyond that, they, I could really feel that they, they want to share the value and the meaning to life that they found with people that would benefit from this as well. Um, and later on, many of the people that joined the Unification Church in Bulgaria left and didn't stay in the church. Um, and I felt, I mean, there were many reasons why, and uh, there was a lot of confusion and misunderstanding and hurt uh, on personal level, I, I think. Uh, so, it was not easy to feel comfortable to be with others when this was happening. So, um, I understand why people chose that or made the conclusion that this, this is not their church. Like, they don't feel at home there, you know. Um, and many people will say, oh, you know, but you cannot leave the Unification Church and, you know, the church will persecute you. And this is complete nonsense. Um, yeah, like if people feel really attached to someone and they feel like, oh, you know, I'm losing some really precious person in my life, they may want to uh, uh, hold on to them uh, more like a, as a person who um, kind of is dependent on that person. But that's a different thing. Uh, Mostly, like if, if people decide that they cannot uh, follow this faith or they don't want to follow this faith or um, my experiences uh, internationally, not just personally, like with the people that I met that left the church, is that uh, no one was, went after them. No one was, you know, chasing them or, you know, um, people were not happy. And uh, it was, I mean, painful for everybody, I think, uh, to lose friends and uh, not, to, not to have meaning and to share meaning. But um, there was no, like, policy that you should, you know, go after them or something. So the people who experience these kind of things uh, in some kind of singular cases, uh, they probably deal with something that uh, is more on a personal level by, like, somebody was a member or 
in some position of authority uh, who personally felt that for them this was important. But I've never seen a policy uh, that demanded this. Of course, uh, like every other faith, we theologically we believe that uh, people can be saved by being members. And not so much by being members of the church, but uh, the main kind of um, uh, value proposition of the Unification Church is the blessing. Uh, and why this is the case is because uh, uh, Reverend Moon um, believes he was given the authority by God to uh, pass on to humankind, to everyone who wants to receive, the original blessing that he wanted to give to Adam and Eve, through which their lineage is removed from the fallen lineage and connected to God's lineage, God's original lineage. And people can speculate. They can say, oh, we believe this is like this or we don't believe this is like this. But um, because I am blessed and I participate in the blessing uh, and I try to understand all my life, what does this blessing actually mean uh, through what Raman Moon is saying and his uh, wife, Hank Jahan, what they're saying about the meaning and the value of the blessing. Um, and um, it's not a guarantee for happiness, but it's, it's a proposition for a, for a more meaningful life. Because um, if we say we want to have um, a marriage uh, where we made the pledge in front of God um, and we want to see uh, ourselves as people uh, who are God's children and our spouse, husband or wife, is a child of God and we want to see the value of a child of God in that person um, and we want to believe that we have been removed from the fallen lineage uh, and even if we make mistakes uh, uh, in our personal relationship, we want to ap uh, apologize to each other, apologize in front of God, <coughs> and do better, and try try to excel, and support others in doing the same. So I think this is a really global movement for uh, bringing a new dimension of meaning to life and to family, to families. So I personally would encourage anyone uh, to re inquire into the blessing and um, find out what the meaning of the blessing is. Don't, don't just read the negative media reports, but read what uh, Sun Ming Moon thinks about the blessing, why he set up the blessing. There are a few websites where you could read unredacted, uh, uh, original uh, printed uh, speeches. Um, I think it was unification.net, one of them. Um, but there are many. If you Google, you will find a lot of them. Or you can just buy books online uh, and read them for yourself at home. And I, 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 I've done this in the past. And um, like I would spend a long time trying to understand like a sing single sentence because like to me, it didn't make sense why, why he said this. But I thought it must have some kind of meaning in the context of everything else he's saying. And usually it does. Um, not usually, not every time it does. Like whatever I was trying to understand, uh, I, I could usually understand that it has like contextual meaning uh, in the overall explanations. Um, so the way that Reverend Moon sees the, uh, or the world was shown to him is as a world that uh, has, was removed from God with Adam and Eve's decision. So God lost the ability to communicate with his children. Uh, they left him. Uh, and uh, Archangel Lucifer, who became Satan, he uh, became the false parents of humankind. So he inspired a selfish love. And Adam and Eve uh, chose to live according to this selfish love and uh, practice this selfish love in their own family and create a tradition out of it, which was not why God created them. So God could never accept this. Uh, and he's been trying through the ages to find people who would understand his original intention. 
who would resonate with this original intention and he would give them revelations and um, inspirations to share with others uh, and to try and create an environment where this original happiness that God intended for us can be revealed more and more uh, through building families and you know communities and clans and then building societies and one day building an entire world um, centered around this original standard of love that God intended. And I find this to be beautiful uh, because um, I, I think like no matter how much per a person knows um, academically, uh, one cannot know everything. <clears throat> and uh, no matter how much money a person has, he will never have enough. Um, so this, 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 or if you have even, if you excel in some profession and become really excellent, um, this doesn't guarantee that you will be fulfilled and happy in your life because life is not just work and life is not just money and salary. Um, so, um, finding like wider and bigger dimensions to life uh, and deeper meaning to life um, makes life more fulfilling. And I remember I watched watching the movie um, a while back when I was kind of new to faith. Uh, we were watching the movie about St. Francis and how he abandoned the physical uh, wealth that his family had and um, he found happiness in a very very simple life because there was happiness to be found uh, he wasn't crazy uh, he was inspired to look for this deeper happiness and he found it and he lived as a very happy man and he inspired many others to understand that you don't have to have to be happy. And I'm not saying we should not have. I'm saying you don't have to have to be happy. And whatever you have, if you look at what you have, even if it's very little, you can be grateful for it and be happy. And no one can stop you from that. I grew up in a communist country. We didn't have, with communist country. We didn't have much. The whole system was quite bankrupt by the time I was like my teens and late teens, late teens. You know, so there was not much in the shops, and we had to, you know, find a way to take care of, you know, had our own garden, take took care of animals, and made like planted our own crops and things. So um, because there was not much, um, but I remember being happy with the little things we had and and there were times in my life when um, I had even less than this uh, and very very difficult uh, situations uh, but with this mindset that first of all God exists and God loves me uh, and other things will come in life uh, there is never reason to be desperate. There is always hope tomorrow or after tomorrow or in a week or in a month. Uh, and the things that we have, no matter how little they are, uh, they're something to be grateful for. So when we look at the things that we have and we are grateful for them, suddenly the feeling is that we are very rich. Like we can say, oh, but others don't even have this. And, and suddenly you feel very rich. And of course, it helped me to kind of see real poverty. Like I lived in Ethiopia and um, I, I thought Bulgarian people were not very rich, communist countries. But then I, I was in Ethiopia and I saw people who had really, really very little compared to us. And suddenly I thought, and they didn't look unhappy. Which was, like I was thinking, they have so little, 
and they still find happiness. They can, you know, laugh and run, and I'm, I'm sure they would, you know, be happy or maybe more content if you had more, if they had more. But even with what they had, like it was enough for them to be happy, and they could still love each other as husband and wife, and love their children, and love their friends and relatives, you know, even when they had nothing. So this was this was really fascinating to see that. Uh, uh, there is happiness beyond having things. And, yeah. Finding my own faith uh, through the Unification Church and uh, the guidance of uh, Sun Myung Moon was really very impactful for me. So, I would encourage anyone to uh, Research faith, even if it's not the Unification Church. But if you if you want to research the Unification Church, by all means, like I think, if if you're serious enough and you ignore all the complete nonsense that the media is reprinting over the years, a um, few negative stories were printed many years ago, and then, um, yeah, they just reprint them again and again. Uh, so if you can ignore this and really genuinely search. You will find interesting things. Thanks very much.